my challenge is basically the idea that uh, a free society is possible. And I, I think it's not based on human nature, you know. Human nature, there's a part of everyone that wants to be violent and aggressive against others. And while certain individuals may be able to suppress that nature in a society that uh, those violent tendencies always come out. Well, I shouldn't say always. I suppose a uh, free society is possible in a very small and temporary sense, but uh, as a as a paradigm shift, like you like to say, I do not believe it's possible. Oh wow, this is a great challenge. I thought I thought when he said, "Well, I'm not a statist." Oh, this is going to be boring. But no, you you've brought up a very good point, and and I actually I'm I'm excited to get into this with you if you're willing to have a, a, a bit of a conversation about this, and um, maybe you'll convince me that I'm wrong that it's not possible. But I'm pretty sure as 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 the arguments are coalescing in my brain as I ramble to allow that process to take place. I think we're going to have I think I think I've got a pretty good uh, response to this. And and there is some clarification here necessary not just in, you know, terminology but in in our standards of what constitutes a free society. So, uh you are you do believe in the ideal of a society in which there is no interpersonal violence and it is completely based on private property. Is that correct? Absolutely. I, uh, as a personal philosophy, I definitely agree that uh, the non-aggression principle is the way to go. And as an ideal, you know, if if we could reach that society, that would be great. You know, but okay. it, it's it's like perfection. You know, it's you want to strive for, for for perfection, but it's not something that is realistically attainable. Okay, and you think that I'm advocating for this perfect nonviolent utopia? No, I'm. I know you always you talk a lot about a paradigm shift, having like a critical mass of people that want to uh, want to be free and have liberty in a society, and that might be possible temporarily. But history shows that freedom comes and goes in cycles. You'll have a, a more free society, and that will be followed by a more oppressive society, and so on and so forth. Okay, that's okay. Well, first, let me uh, address the thing about cycles and that it, it's uh, while I agree that uh, there are changes and it goes back and forth, I think if you look at the historical trends, it's not a back and forth like a pendulum swinging, it's like a process of two steps forward, one step backwards, and that the overall amount of coercion in society has decreased from the state of nature. In fact, now. We have the studies that, at least on a relatively short time frame, not talking about millennia, but hundreds or thousands of years, you are now less likely than ever before to be subject to interpersonal violence by, you know, f subject to an assault from another human being. That's an incredible thing to be celebrated. Now, I, I will say, so we, we, we do have to get clear on your concept of a free society when you say it's not possible. Um, and and I've, I've said that a stateless society is not a perfectly free society in the sense that you can eliminate all institutionalized violence in government, but if someone gets drunk and punches somebody in the face for the owner of that face, it's not very free at that moment, right? Their property is being assaulted. And that's, that stuff is always, uh, or, or potentially could always happen, right? All right, yeah, I like that definition. Let's go with that. Uh, a stateless society, let's, instead of... Uh... But okay, but you're you're also saying that that is not possible. So right. even even by my looser standard of a free society is one where yes, occasionally violence happens. Yes, yes, occasionally theft happens, but we deal with it without the state. We deal with it through dispute resolution organizations. We d deal with it with um, you know arbitration and free market censure, things like that. You think even that is not possible? It's not possible as the normal. Like I said, it is possible in small, temporary situations okay. in small, temporary societies. Okay. But as the normal, definitely not. Okay, well, I'll tell you why that's wrong, and I'll tell you why even my relatively modest vision of a free society where there is some personal interpersonal violence is uh, only a temporary step to the ideal by the standard of universal nonviolence actually being embraced as the norm and why this is inevitable. And, and I invite you to challenge me every step of the way here, okay? So please, please feel free to jump in. But again, looking at the broader historical trends, right? That humanity seeks greater harmony. We seek greater assertion of our own freedom, of our own self-will. And I believe that uh, even democracy 
is a step in that process, right? That you go from, uh, and this is a very rough, uh, you know, if you could summarize the evolution of governance or government in human history, it would be from tribalism, right? Where you had a single group of people and whoever was in charge locally was in charge to feudalism or monarchies or some central control of authoritarianism where you have a single singular authoritarian government to democracy where there is citizen participation, right? That, that kind of sums it up, you know? Yes, it's happened at various stages in different places at different speeds, right? But that's sort of the general evolution of government, right? Right, but that, like, the, the statist mentality hasn't changed, you know? Like, violence amongst individuals might go down, but that's only because it's centralized and monopolized by Well, the hold state. on, hold but, on. All right, hold on. I, I will, let me, let me address the mentality of statism hasn't changed. I very much disagree, and I think it's pretty obvious that from the state, let, let's, let's go back to state of nature, where whoever can pick up the biggest rock is in charge, right? The best hunter or whoever's actually physically able to bring in the most food, and you don't even think do I oppose this guy? Do I have freedom? And this is generally a man in your, you know, hunter-gatherer primitive group. And it, there's, there's no thought to this. There's no, statism is, well, if he's the biggest, if he's the best hunter in the tribe, everybody's just going to do what he says, right? And this is from very, very crude civilization. And then you had, well, there's a king. Well, if you're going to be in control of other people, I mean, I'm a peasant, but I'm capable of feeding myself. But if you're a king, uh, well, I'll submit to the king, right? And this isn't the, su supposing that every serf bought into the system and didn't understand what it really was, but the, there, there was at least a certain change in the paradigm when people realized, hey, we don't all need to cluster together in this group of people just to survive and be able to feed each other, feed ourselves, that that improvement of technology, of agriculture, allowed people to say, well, heck, I mean, if I have a little plot of land, I can farm it, I can sustain myself. I don't need, and I, I don't need someone for, for that. So then you had an, an evolution of the racket into monarchies, which was a product of that, which said, well, if you're going to oppress people, if you're going to control and exploit them, you better be able to convince them that you have the divine right of kings or that you have some, you know, special authority, or at least that there is some external threat that you are being protected from, right? Yeah, but like you said, the, the racket evolves, but it doesn't go away. Right. They just but, okay. find newer and better and more subtle ways to oppress you. The okay. oppression never goes away. Absolutely. And you're looking at it from the perspective of the oppressor. I, and you said the status mentality. So I was analyzing from the perspective of the victim here, or the subjects. Okay. And, and in that sense, you're right. The, the mentality of state is... Uh, so I'll, 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 I'll give you this point here. The, by, your, by your perspective... The, or the perspective of the oppressor, the statism racket hasn't changed at all. It's how much will people tolerate me fucking with them and ripping them off, right? And that will, that will, there will always be people who will do that. But the question they are asking is, how much can I get away with, right? How much will people tolerate? And it's, well, if I'm the biggest hunter, I can also have sex with all of the women and make all the other men in this tribe my bitch, right? You know, and if, it, well... If, if the peasants think that they need a king, I can convince them that I'm the king, and so on and so forth, right? So you're, you're right that, that that fundamental attitude among the oppressors is the same, but it's, it's always dependent on how do I actually make this racket work so that I can sleep at night without the peasants coming in and burning my house down. You know, there's, there's the, the limit of oppression is based on, as I think it was Frederick Douglass said, the tolerance of the oppressed, right? The tolerance has gotten less and less. And right. now, go ahead. You make a good point that it is based on the tolerance of the oppressed, but I don't think that tolerance has gone down. If you look at the atrocities of the state in modern times, they're just as bad or worse as they were in ancient times. Well, very good point. And I would say that we are in the middle of a major step backwards right now that is a product of institutionalized modern bureaucratic governments being simply hitting the mathematical point on the exponential growth curve where they are out of control and uh, the, uh, now a uh, um, metastasizing cancer on society. However, however, the, and, and you're right to say that in some ways the mentality has taken a step backwards as the propaganda has gotten more effective, right, as people support uh, well, you could look at, say, large-scale war, right, is the most atrocious thing that governments do, right? 
if World War II or World War I were the height of that phenomenon, if anything, we have come down from the peak. People do not tolerate large-scale oppression the, or large-scale uh, armed conflict. You need far better excuses than you used to to be able to say, you need to go onto the other side of the world and go kill people. I went to Iraq. Trust me, the propaganda and the excuses were a lot better who I was as a gullible teenager falling for we need to you know have a military to keep us safe from terrorism and we need to go into Iraq to defeat Saddam Hussein and weapons of mass destruction was way more thought out, better produced. I mean, you look at the TV studio they made for press conferences for the you know Defense Department officials in Iraq. Holy shit, right? You know, you look at the the complexity of the excuse. You had to convince me not, oh, well, the American people are being threatened. You had to convince me, hey, you're doing a good thing for the world. Hey, you're protecting people. Hey, you're going on a humanitarian mission to liberate people. That excuse is like, how do you convince people to go to war has gotten harder and harder. And I think even though you might say today in the United States, you know, more of our money than ever proportionately even goes to the government, the demand, and this again, back to the general trend, to, towards democracy, or even more speci a, a specific form of democracy, a republic, yes, we demand, we demand a voice. So in that sense, the tolerance, the status mentality has changed, and over time, people demand more and more self-government, or rather, closer to self-government, and if you see it through the lens of self-government, they are demanding that more of their right to self-government be respected. Well, now, I guess the argument, or both our positions boils down to, you think that society is taking two steps forward, one step back. I think that society just takes one step forward, then one step back, because yes, right now we are at a peak of status atrocity and coercion mm -hmm. and i do believe we will go to a freer society in the future but that's when people let their guard down that's when people advocate for progressive reforms and things like that so the state will come back there will be another step forward for statism another step <laughs> back for right. freedom okay no and and i'm really excited by this because you're in a place where you know, I was uh, a couple of years ago with this, where you're not sure. And if someone were to come to you like Alex Jones saying, it's time to grab your pitchfork, and if, or, or Ronald Reagan saying, you know, if we don't defend freedom in America, it's 100 years of darkness, you're going to go, oh, crap, and you're going to be led into doing things that are not in your own self-interest. And that's a very dangerous proposition. And I realized that I was in your state of mind a few years ago, and the way I came to this conclusion that I'm going to share with you now is sort of the result of having to square the contradictions that I saw with that, but also because I have seen now, I mean, I was looking for this beautiful uh, trend in human history that I want to share with you that I, I haven't quite gotten to yet. Because you might, uh, with everything I've said, you could still say, okay, Adam, that's the historical trend. I get it. That's just a product of where we've been and where we're going, and that doesn't mean this is going to continue. But here's what I want to share with you as the underlying concept behind all of this that will give you absolute faith, not just that a voluntary society is possible, but inevitable, and that eventually a truly universally nonviolent society is also, if not inevitable, at least a very distinct possibility. I think that it, it, it kind of depends what is the definition of violence, what is the relative market value, how much do people actually care about, say, I bump into you on the sidewalk, is that an act of aggression, or you know, does that cross the line? Do we bother to, you know, to, to try to eliminate that compared to all the other beautiful challenges before us as humanity? So, to the core of this, the beautiful idea behind all of this is that it is driven by technology. And I mentioned agriculture. And agriculture is a technology. It is a concept that human beings use to better manipulate their environment to serve their needs. Technology, medical technology, computer technology, communication technology, all of these things free us up in terms of our uh, ability to take time to do things other than hunt and gather and feed ourselves. And we, are coming to, we have come to the point now where, at least technologically, we're capable of feeding everybody on the planet very easily, reliably, without, with, with, with a, an extremely tiny minority, like less than 1% of the population, actually being involved in the labor necessary to feed everyone else. That's an incredible step forward. And the nice thing about this is that technology is exponential. So what I have to do before I get into where this is going, I have to make the connection for you 
that technology and technological empowerment leads to more freedom because it leads to more time being allowed to go to understanding freedom and to reducing violence. And you don't even have to understand freedom. That's the greatest part of this. You don't have to understand freedom. Society doesn't have to understand freedom to understand that violence is bad. You know, like raising our children with nonviolence didn't come about because people realized, well, children are people too and we should respect their self-ownership. No, it's because in the 70s, a guy named Dr. Spock wrote a book that said, hey, by the way, hitting your kids makes them dumber and here's how you can raise kids without spanking. And this is going to raise more intelligent children. Everybody goes, oh, I can have smarter kids. How do I do that? Oh, nonviolence? That gets me that? Okay, great, cool. And in every sense, if you understand the ideal of freedom as universal nonviolence, and you understand that there's that capitalist ideal, right? All human interactions are free of coercion. That's humanity meeting its potential in terms of, you know, an economy, right? Everybody is harmoniously interacting for each other's benefit. Then you, un- you also understand how that in, in, in order to even conceive of that, to have that, you have to take us out of the state of nature. So if state of nature, and I know this is in a sense an oversimplification, if state of nature is, you know, you sleep for eight hours a day and 16 hours a day, you're hunting, gathering, and worrying about fucking and raising babies, right? You know, like that's, that's your life. And someone comes along and says, well, hey, I'm the biggest hunter in the tribe. I'm bringing in food. You're going to do what I say. You don't even have time to think about questioning that. You're scrambling to survive, right? Right. This, I get what you're saying. Like, technology is a wonderful tool, but it, it's, it's just a tool. And my, my, art, my counter to your argument is that uh, no matter how good the tools are, they're only as good or as bad as the people that are using them. Mm-hmm. And my argument is that statism is a manifestation on a larger scale of of human nature. Okay, hold on a second. Hold on, hold on. I, your none of your assertions are technically incorrect, but is not technology also a tool for self improvement? Now you might say, okay, it can be, but it could also be for self destruction. It could also be used counterproductively. And I will say, fine, yes, on an individual basis, but in terms of the species-wide historical trend, absolutely not. The empowering effect of technology for self-improvement, for understanding yourself better, for improving your relationships. If you believe that the ideal of nonviolence is better for everyone, right? Is it that you have more prosperity, you have the rights and the wills of individuals respected, that that is what you have in a nonviolent society, This is not an ideology. This is a simple fact of nature. Libertarianism is not an ideology. It is the simple observance that nonviolence is superior to violence being consistently applied, right? So if- You're assuming that people can make that rational, that rational uh, assertion, and that's been shown throughout history not to be the case, you know? Right, and here's where I will make the case that technology inevitably will make humanity, is making humanity, excuse me, already is making humanity more rational, more capable of making decisions based on facts and simple awareness rather than ignorance, superstition, and guessing and giving into the primal impulses of violence. So now you can, you can, uh, you don't even have to agree with that those, those fundamental laws that I believe I have embraced, that I have observed, that are undeniable in the sense that the, you know, like, uh, you know, gravity is a law, the law of technology improving exponentially, right? You know, you create agriculture and you have division of labor. Well, guess what? Now you have the resources to create way more technology. You know, you have computers that are now programming themselves. You have the, you know, Moore's law and, and Moore's law is an, a really important thing here when you talk about the effects on technology and awareness in modern society. So if Moore's law, the exponential growth curve of computing power is driving everything like productivity, life expectancy, awareness, everything else, then all of that is going to result in less violence because people are going to want all of the things that that offers. But let me, let me even break it down to a more specific, deliberate trend that you can already observe, all right? Because I had this fantasy in, in thinking about all this, hey man, wouldn't it be awesome if at some point everybody had a therapy robot? You know, because violence, interpersonal violence, status violence is based on psychological deficiency, right? 
that you are unable to communicate with someone, you are unable to uh, feed yourself, whatever the case may be. There is something that is wrong with someone's mind when they choose to engage in violence that is unnecessary, right? I disagree with you on that. Okay, hit that, it. That's my assertion is that you're, you're stating that violence and aggression is due to a lack of self-awareness, uh, ignorance, or a... Uh, basically... Uh, it's basically a, a result of uh, ignorance and lack of knowledge. And I believe that violence is something deeper. It's it's built into every human soul, if you will, so to speak. Okay, hold on. That's your, Those are not contradictory ideas. We all have, to, to say that violence is a natural human impulse does not contradict anything I'm saying. I'm not trying to deny that. Self-destruction, uh, depression... Uh, hatred, anger, all of those things, natural human impulses, um, you know, taking a shit wherever you happen to feel like it, that's a natural impulse. That doesn't mean we didn't pretty much all learn to use toilets, you know? Th so, again, the argument there is not contradictory and still does not disprove my assertion. But to, to go, to, to again, to make this even more specific, it, it, and, and I, I, I bet you would agree that the major even if you think that it is primal, that every individual incident of violence could be addressed by either reducing uh, imp poverty or reducing psychological issues, correct? Could be reduced, but not eliminated. Okay, so in what case, let me ask you then, and, and I'll get, I will come back to this, but the therapy robot idea, but in, in, in what case is there, like give me an example of a kind of interpersonal violence that, that d is not addressed by this. Well, let me, let me, tell you uh, an example here if, let's say someone cuts you off on the freeway mm -hmm. like you will have an uprising anger if you're human and you might say to yourself oh fuck that guy like or maybe if you're a even worse person you might flip him off or if you're even worse person you might pull out a gun and road rage on him but so everybody has those impulses to one degree or another some more than others and i don't think technology can can cure those impulses. We'll always have those impulses. We might be able to reduce their manifestation, but we can't eliminate the, the impulses. Sure. Themselves. Okay, fine. I'm not saying that we need to eliminate the impulses or the thought patterns or the emotions. I'm saying we're talking about the manifestations. So, mm -hmm. But they will always manifest themselves to one degree or another. They will manifest perhaps in so your mind. No. People well, can repress them and or express them constructively, but some Exactly, people, exactly. Uh, okay, so here's where we get to the point where things get really interesting, and, and I'll, I'll bring it back to what you just said. Can we control those impulses, right? So let's say, right, like I had this, this fantasy that at some point we all get therapy robots, and, and, and in a bigger picture, I'm sure you'd agree with me, the majority of violence in society is driven by people who have clearly identifiable psychological problems, either impulse control problems or some sort of insecurity that drives them to violence or some sort of need where they feel that they are driven to violence by the desire to feed themselves or whatever. They don't see that nonviolence can be better. Um, there is, or like, right. huh? Or pride. Or pride, yes. Pride is a great example. Or like, you know, racism, which is also driven by, again, insecurity. And insecurity is a big part of this. And this is why government, and I'm sure you're on board with this, this is why government beats us down, right? Government wants you to feel insecure. They want you to feel like you need an authority, right? Obviously, right. technology is going to help us figure that one out. So I thought that at some point, you know, we know at some point we're going to have computers that are smarter than us. And at, at that point, we're all going to have, maybe it's a little floating head in our house just sort of following us around. That's, that's how I saw it at first, right? Is that, and then it's a th but it's going to be a therapy robot. And, you know, if, if, if you're, if, like, before you go, you're about to beat your wife, it says, wait a second, tell me how you're really feeling before you do that. And, you know, that you have this thing that, that is able to do that and that, that just having computers that are able to identify those impulses and, and have that presence in our life. And we already have this in a way with our smartphones and our pockets. You know, in some ways, they are computers that are already smarter than us. But that, that all aside, how, uh, anytime I, I look forward and think, okay, is this going to happen? How is this going to happen? I feel like my sort of one of my tests is, is it already happening, right? So if I say, if I, if I were to make the assertion, technology is gonna make us more free, I would have to prove to myself, or at least one of my tests of this is, well, is technology today already making us more free? 
So if I'm making the assertion that in the future, technology will make us more self-aware, better psychologically balanced, I would have to prove to myself at least that it already is. And I would have to prove to myself fundamentally that it is by nature of being technology. So I would go back and say, were the first stone tools, was the first development of agriculture something that allowed us to be more psychologically healthy? If only by freeing, us the to freeing up the time to allow us to develop language and to be able to communicate better with each other? Yeah, absolutely. But then, okay. hold on, I can even connect it to computers. So you look at the internet today, how many people have been able to connect with each other, if it's, you know, even through okcupid.com or whatever, but how many people on forums, you know, uh, have had conversations uh, for all sorts of various, you know, traumatic experiences that they've had that they would never have had without being able to connect with others that way. So now you get into the practical part. You talk about impulse control. If I may just bring it back to that first, then... You have this, we, we know that the computers are getting more and more integrated with our lives. That we're, you know, we have smartphones in our pockets and maybe that's all it's gonna take. But I am very confident we are gonna have computer chips if not in our skulls mounted to our heads or in our contact lenses or something like that. And eventually if that is something that prevents someone from ever being violent because it's, it, as soon as you have that impulse you go, the computer sets off a little ding and goes, Hey, back to your happy place. Violence is, you know, your impulse to anger keeps you away from having the, the, the emotional empowerment to choose to be happy. And this is an important part of my book is that emotional freedom means choosing your state of mind. Now, emotions exist. 100%. Thank you. So emotions have a very important evolutionary purpose, right? You know, when we were not able to assimilate all the information in our environment and use it rationally, well, okay, now we have an emotional impulse, that serves us, we go do what we want to do, we fuck, we kill, we hit, we love, whatever it is, right? And now, you can look even in sexual relations, they're way more thought out, way more deliberate than, well, you know, it just happened and now there's a baby. So, now, I, I, I want to bring this home, we don't have a lot of time left, but this has been a lot of fun, I, 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 I want to hear your objections. Say again? I've had a lot of fun too. This good, has been great. good, good. And I, I hope you're tracking. I hope you're starting to see some of these beautiful long-term ideas that give me so much faith in this. And in, in that it comes down to the belief that technology is fundamentally empowering and technology is on an exponential growth curve. And what that will eventually do is not only render government obsolete, it will render violence obsolete. So back to the example of an individual gets punched in the face even, and for that victim, it's not a free society. I don't think we're eventually going to even, uh, you know, if you're the guy that really wants nonviolence, you're not going to be around the, the, the caveman who has anger management issues so bad that he actually just gets drunk and starts punching people. Like, society is not going to tolerate that to the effect that it actually holds us back. Now, am I predicting, now this is me making a market prediction, right? That even that minute example of violence will be worth the attention of eradicating. This is why I earlier compared it to like bumping into someone on the sidewalk. Are we going to devote our attention to preventing that from ever happening or are there more important challenges? Yeah, I don't know. But I do believe that because of these greater trends, we are going to come to the point where a truly voluntary, not just a stateless, no institutionalized violence, but a truly voluntary nonviolent society is going to be what we achieve. Whether or not that's actually realistic, eh, we'll let the market decide. But in terms of the, evo the, the evolution to the point where large-scale institutionalization of force and all of the psychological insecurities that drive that and all of the inadequacies that people feel that make them turn to leaders or the economic deprivation that makes people think we need violent force redistribution of wealth that justifies all the other bullshit government does, no, no, no. That's going away. That will not survive. There is no way in this evolutionary process, this ad adoption of greater technologies, as Moore's cur uh, curve accelerates through Moore's law, the you know doubling of computer speed every 18 months, as uh, everything that is driven by that, life expectancy, prosperity, goes up just as exponential, the idea that force and violence are still going to be around is, is actually, I think, harder to justify. Just remember, someone invented a stone tool to make hunting or eating easier, but then someone used that same stone tool to kill someone else. So All right, technology well, can be used for good, but can also be used for just as great an evil. All right, and you're, you're right. And I, and I have, thank you for pointing that out, because I have always included the caveat. While I believe that this is the dominant curve of the arc of human history, there is the possibility 
of a cataclysmic event that you know nuclear weapons are going to be used to blow everybody up before we re reach this beautiful point and i don't think that that's impossible and i when i when i make these predictions when i say that a stateless or voluntary society is inevitable i i'm not saying with absolute certainty that is going to happen but it would take some aberration it would take some abnormal cataclysmic horrendous event to throw humanity off that course well i hope you're right adam that's that's one thing that i think we can agree on is that would be awesome if if that were attainable well thank you and jesse did, did i at least get to impart on you the, the the beautiful ideas behind my optimism gave me a great perspective adam i don't think i agree with it but it's a great perspective well i hope you'll consider it and and i i understand that throwing all this at you and i know it's been uh it's been a great 30 minute conversation already although mostly just me ranting here um I, I appreciate the opportunity to share this, and I understand not everybody can embrace it right away. It takes some some mulling over, some you know accepting to do. You just just like the philosophy of liberty itself. But I, I think if you give this enough thought, I, I think you'll come to agree with me. And I, I would hope that uh, maybe if you have some thoughts on this after meditating on it, perhaps you'll you'll give us a call back. All right. Well, I'll keep an open mind. Excellent, Jesse. Thank you so much for the call. Don't forget to like share and please subscribe to this channel you as a free beautiful independent human being with inalienable rights own yourself <laughs> you can't expose yourself i saw you